Bibles, we invite you to turn to the book of 1 John, chapter 5. 1 John, chapter 5. As you make your way there, we'll return to the Lord once again in prayer tonight. We've got to come to you tonight. I'm so thankful for the blessings you've given us, for allowing us the opportunity to be here, and for allowing us to have a word that we might look to and songs that we might sing of you. God, we're just so grateful for the abundance of resources and opportunities that you have blessed your church with, and I ask that you help us that we might take uh, full use of them, that we take advantage of every opportunity that you would give us, that we might grow together in love and in unity and in you as one body. Thank you so much for the salvation or redemption that you brought our way, that we might be saved into one body and experience the unity that you experience, that you would have for us to have, uh, that, 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 that unity that you would pray of in the book of John, and that as you and the Father are one, that we might be made one with you, and we have one uh, one fellowship uh, and come together for the labor of the same gospel. We're just so thankful uh, for the unity that your redemption provides for one another. We thank you so much for the body that, that it would uplift one another. Uh, help us as that body that we might be uh, very zealous to do the good work that you've given us to do in this earth and in this life. That we take advantage of every opportunity to labor. Uh, that we'd be used of you to expand your kingdom and not our own understanding that your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, an eternal kingdom that will never fade away. Uh, that it would be uh, uh, greatly to our benefit that we might labor to that, not just, just ours, but to yours. And I ask that you help us that we might have a greater concern for that which is pleasing to you or ever pleasing to ourselves. Tell me, as I was saying, as I know that I do not have the strength or the ability to do so, I don't have the right to do so. You, know, you give me opportunity too, and that's an opportunity I greatly thank you for. And I pray that you would use this, such an opportunity and such an occasion that I might be used according to your will and in a way that you'd have me to be used that your message would be brought forth and not my own. For those who would be here lost, we ask that they would see a need to trust you, understanding their condition, understanding their, the simplicity of the gospel, that they may be found to be in you, that they may trust in you, in your plan of redemption and in the work that you've done for salvation and no longer seek to trust in themselves. It's in your word and whatever we pray for you. So worthy. Amen. Amen. First John chapter 5. Uh, we, we kind of covered verse 5 last week. We'll, we'll pick up reading in verse 5. That way we can better understand verse 6. But here it would say, Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is true. Here, at, at this point of, of chapter 5, that there is now once again a, a time that John would set aside within this epistle to really stress the uh, reality of, that Jesus is the Christ, he kind of stresses the witness of such, uh, such a truth. That this man, Jesus of Nazareth, he is not just Jesus of Nazareth. We've discussed several different uh, ideas that, that were very, very, uh, several different false teachings that were around the church, that were confusing the church at such a time, and, and that, that one of them, uh, that, that there would be all sorts of perversions over the deity of Christ, that some would say that, uh, that that uh, that Jesus of Nazareth was just a man, and that as his at, at his uh, baptism that that uh, deity kind of fell on him, that the Spirit indwelt him, and that that Spirit would leave him prior to his death, and that, that uh, the idea was that uh, a God so perfect and righteous that he could not uh, subject himself to the cruelties of man, and that he would leave. And, uh, that, that here we see very plainly that John combats such an idea. He, he combats all of these ideas. That, that either tried to rob Jesus of Nazareth of his humanity or of his deity. That throughout the book we see constantly this stressing of this idea that he was, he was man. He was fully God and yet still fully man. That he, he really stresses these points. He opens the book actually by stressing the reality of this account. Then that here we kind of see it again. And we spoke last week to, about that overcoming, and, and, and uh, we'll make mention of it towards the end of, uh, of the message tonight. But, uh, but that he speaks of this overcoming, but that, that the only way to do so is to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. 
And he, he helps us to understand that Jesus is the Son of God and is not as simple as, or not, not, it is very simple, don't, don't get me wrong. It, it is not as though that John is just saying, oh, just, just trust me. Uh, oh, just believe me that this is the case. That he lays out the groundwork as to why this is something that is worth believing in. That this isn't just some words, it isn't just some idea that John has come up with, but rather a, a, an objective truth that we can take great comfort and great assurance in believing in. That he, if y'all recall, just over a year ago as we started this study, and the opening of the book, that, that we took time to, to read these first few verses, and I'll turn and read them, 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. And he would say, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled the word of life. That's the opening to the book, to this epistle. And we see in the opening of this epistle, this is not just somebody's ideas. We read a lot of ideas. Uh, that in my studies, I, I read a lot of ideas. I read a whole lot of different writings of different people in preparation for the message tonight. Now that we read these ideas, and these ideas are all well and good, but what we're reading here is something different. That this isn't just somebody's ideas, that that one, it is one primarily, and most importantly, under the Spirit of God, but also one who has not just heard about Jesus. He is not one who's just been taught about this Jesus, but rather one who has heard Jesus speak himself, who has seen this Jesus of Nazareth with his very own eyes, that he has looked upon, that his very hands have handled, and he declares him to be the word of life. That he would go on to say in verse 2, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. And then he would say, That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. That he starts this book by setting the groundwork to help us to see that this is this is a different kind of writing. This is a different account. This is an eyewitness account. And he stresses this account and this reality through the book, and he gets to chapter five. And he kind of shifts. He, he, keeps, he keeps on with the importance of Jesus Christ being God and being man. Uh, him being the Redeemer and Savior of the world. But he pivots a little bit. It is no, you notice it's no longer just speaking from his point of view. But he actually shifts it in verse 6. And begins to describe it by the witness that God has given us. The witness from God's perspective, if you will. That it is no longer just man's eyewitness account, but rather, as we'll go on to eventually get to, uh, that he would go on to say there in chapter 5, uh, that, that I'm struggling to find the exact verse, but he would get to the point that he would say uh, that you believe the witness of man, the witness, in verse 9, here we go, we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. And so this is actually what he's building towards, beginning in verse 6, this witness of God. It's no longer just the witness of man, although there are plenty of men and women who witness. Those are very important witnesses. But the witness of God is greater. And so he spends some time to focus on God's testimony that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ. That is very important. There were a whole lot of people claiming to be that Messiah. There were a whole lot, and as a matter of fact, the people of that day were looking for the Messiah. So that, it, that Jesus wasn't the first person to come on the scene saying, hey, I'm that promised Messiah. He wasn't the last one to come on the scene. As a matter of fact, there are still some today that come on the scene that declare themselves to be that promised Messiah. And there are, are folks that would bear witness to that. There are folks that would, would lay claim to that. That is true, but there is one that God himself has laid claim to, and that was Jesus of Nazareth, this very same Jesus that John would write of. And so here in verse 6, that the, this, he would begin by building this witness of God by speaking of three things in verse 6. He would make mention of he that came by water and blood. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And then he would make mention 
And he would say, and it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. And so we'll take these three things one by one. Uh, that to, to begin with, I've heard this taught in several different ways, the water and the blood. Uh, and that there are a lot of ideas about it. And, and in my opinion, that there's only one that actually makes sense if we understand the context of that, that, that John is really gearing towards. That's why I spent that time there at the beginning to help you to see that he is he, that it has been a theme within the book to build this case of the witness of God, uh, the, the, the witness that Jesus of Nazareth is God and man, and he can, is going to continue that to show us this witness. And so with this in mind, we're keeping in mind that what he is speaking of is that which testifies or that which bears witness to the truth that Jesus is the Son of God. But there are some ideas that there, there are some that would say that the water and the blood that it would make mention of the two ordinances that the church undergoes, and that that, that wouldn't quite make any sense. That that, it, it, that the ordinances that we partake in, they don't bear witness that Jesus is the Christ. They don't bear witness to us. They don't prove to us that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God. That there are things that we do that are important things, but that would not be what these. This, this verse refers to that that it just would kind of come completely out of left field. But there are those that would make mention how that uh, that it references back to when Jesus was being crucified and that he was uh, stuck in the side and that blood and water would come from him. And, and again, that, that while that's true, that that's a thing that happened, that didn't bear any witness whatsoever to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. Rather, we we have to to, to understand this. We have to understand what is it that that proved. That, that's, that kind of put God's seal of approval on the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. It, and I believe it quite simply would boil down to the water speaking of the beginning of the ministry of Christ and of the blood speaking of the crucifixion of Christ. And we'll turn and we'll read some scriptures to, to, to show us that and to help us to understand the significance of those two events and how that they prove to us and give us assurance that this Jesus of Nazareth is one who we can believe in, that he is one that we can take full assurance in believing that he is the Son of God. Let's start here in the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1. John, chapter 1. And as we continue, I, I don't want it to come across as though that I'm just trying to prove a point. Uh, I'm not trying to, to prove that I'm right and other people are wrong, or that this this isn't just something I come up with. That this this line of thought is one that many folks believe in as well. And I'm not trying to argue and, and prove that this 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 is what's right, but rather uh, that as we would look to these scriptures to to prove to us as children of God that this is a belief that we can take great confidence in. And that was the intention behind what John was writing. And here, so here in John chapter 1, beginning in verse 32. Well, actually start in verse 29. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 29. This is this John that we're reading of is John the Baptist. And I'll say, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now this is, this is a, a very big claim. For John the Baptist to make. Again, there were multiple who, who were around that were claiming to the, be the Messiah. That they were ready for the Messiah, or they thought they were anyways. They were looking for him. They thought they were. But there were those that thought John the Baptist himself was that Messiah. That, that we see that he had declared over and over again, no, I'm not that Messiah. I'm not him. But here, in, that, that Jesus is walking, and he comes up, and John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That this is the one. There might be plenty of others that, that are claiming to be the one, trying to prove themselves as the one. There might be a whole bunch of people with a lot of ideas on who might be the one. And all of these are wrong. And he is declaring publicly, this is the Son of God. What gave him such a confidence? Well, in verse 30, it says, This is he... Of whom I said, After me cometh the man which is preferred before me. For he was before me. But I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore I am come baptizing with water. And John bare record 
saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him, and I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. This is a very important account, a very important testimony and record that we read of here. That is John the Baptist, very well-respected man, a man with a great following, a man who was highly regarded as one who would speak the truth. And that this man, very trustworthy man, who could have had every opportunity to take all the fame and the glory of being the Christ, uh, that, that, that he would actually go on to say that, uh, that, it's not the, the, that he's just the friend of the bridegroom, that it is for the bridegroom to receive the bride, but that he is just the friend who is celebrating that Christ could be preferred above him. That, that this is who we're talking about, the one who could have taken the fame and the glory and who did it. But he would say that, there, that the one who sent him to baptize with water, that we would believe that to be God, and we would all agree that John the Baptist is one sent by God to do his ministry. It says that the one who sent him, God himself, that he, he told him that upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And so because God gave him that, that word, because God did, revealed to him that the one that you see who has the Holy Spirit descending upon him and resting and remaining on him, that is the one who is coming to baptize with the Holy Ghost. That is the one who is the Messiah. That is the one you're waiting for. And John saw that. And if you go back to the book of Matthew chapter 3, it would speak of his baptism. And that as he would baptize John the Baptist, that they would heard a voice from heaven declaring, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. God audibly speaking, and John the Baptist audibly hearing and receiving this instruction that that is the one who is the Son of God. It is God testifying to man at the baptism of Christ, the beginning of his ministry, that this is the Son of God. This is actually the one. And that is such a valuable, valuable thing. And it's such an important Testimony that we would have, again, with so many running around declaring themselves to be the Christ, only one of them could be right. Now, there's only one that could be right, and it's the one who God himself testified of. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And that is why John the Baptist could bear record that this is the Son of God, the one that God declared to be the Son of God. And that, so this would then would mark the beginning of the ministry of Christ. And the ministry of Christ is so, so important to his redemptive work. That everything within his, his ministry would point to his deity. That was much, a large part of the reason why he had a ministry. That for, for one, that it's of great importance because that he would come and he would fulfill these prophecies. And he would uphold these promises to Israel offering to be their Messiah, that, that, that God had made all these promises to Israel, and Christ upheld the promise. He made the offers. That's why, the, if you read the book of Matthew chapter 23, uh, and I think it's also somewhere in the book of Luke, if I recall correctly, that he would make that statement how that they, uh, that, that he would, was, would, would want them, I'll get it right in a minute, uh, that how many times it was that he would say, how many times and he would have taken them in as a hen and take, would take in her chicks. But they would not. They were not willing. That he stood and fulfilled those promises. He stood and fulfilled many great prophecies. That he was the Christ all through his ministry. It is of great importance that the Messiah that came was in line with the promises of God. That that Because it was God. That, he could, that, that the one who was the Messiah couldn't just scrap all of those promises. He couldn't just pretend like all those promises didn't exist. He had to fulfill the promises, and he did. Now, they did not receive it, but that he had made the offer to do it. That pointing again that to, to God's witness through his promises and his word that this is the Son of God, that his works that he performed, those miracles, they were for a reason. 
And it was for a purpose that, that Jesus of Nazareth performed those miracles. He made the purpose known. It's not a secret. That he would often audibly pray uh, out loud of the purpose that they could see that the Father sent him. That he was of the Father. That he was who he claimed to be. In the book of John, chapter 14, well, since we're here in the book of John, we'll flip over a couple pages and read it. John, chapter 14. John chapter 14, verse 11. This would be after Philip would make that request that they show us the Father and, and, and we'll believe. It would be sufficient for us. And in verse 11, and as, as Christ was, was instructing him, he said, Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. This was his response to Philip. As Philip would have his request, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. It, it'll make us content. And he goes on to explain, O oh, Philip, how long have I been with you? Do you not realize that I am the Father? That, 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 that he is one with the Father. Uh, that he which has seen Christ has seen the Father, show, declaring again his deity and his position as that Son of God. And that he would say, Believe me that I am in the Father, the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Or in other words, because of the works that you've seen me do. That, that Philip was there every step of the way. That Philip would be there and they would feed mul multiple multitudes. That Philip would be there as he would see Christ walking on the water. And then eventually that Peter walking on the water as well at Christ's command. That, that, he would, that Philip would be there uh, all throughout the, as he would see the dead raised to life. That he was there at Lazarus' tomb whenever Lazarus came walking out. That he was there for all of these things, beyond a shadow of a doubt. And all the while, understanding and hearing that Jesus is declaring that these things are done, that they might believe that he is the Son of God. That Philip was there every step of the way. And so Jesus, in his, in really in comforting Philip, also reprimanding Philip, but in comforting him, that's what these chapters ultimately were there for was to comfort these disciples as he was fixing to go away. And in order to do this, that he would say, Believe me that I am the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake, because of what you've seen me do. And as we read of the ministry of Christ, that, that it, 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 every bit of it, every single one of those miracles that were done, all of those great things that you've heard of and read, they were all done that we might see that that man was different. That he was simply different. That we see in scriptures miracles being done. You see in scriptures miracles being performed by Elijah, for instance. But you notice what Elijah did as he performed the miracles. That he would give credit to God. That the miracle was performed to prove that God was the one true God. That there were those such as Samson who had great strength, but he received his great strength of God. And God decided to take it away. And he wasn't strong anymore. And then God decided to give it back at the end of, at, right at the end of his life. And all of a sudden he's strong again. That all these others that did these great miracles that they had done them by the power of God. And as Christ comes on the scene, that he declares himself to be one with God and then does these miracles. All proving that he is exactly that. Proving that he is the Son of God. Declaring himself a God-bearing witness to mankind. That this is the Son of God. The ministry of Christ is of great importance to his redemptive work. It, it, it proved his deity, it proved his purity, it proved his zeal, it proved his love, it proved his sinless nature, it proved all of these things. That as we could see him in his daily life to fulfill every aspect of the role of the Messiah. And he did just that. That beyond a shadow of a doubt that we can see that God has testified himself to mankind that Jesus is the Son of God. At beginning of his baptism, also before his baptism, don't get me wrong, uh, but, but at his baptism, at that entrance into the ministry and the usage of that ministry, God bore, bore witness, if that's how you say that, to mankind uh, that that was the Son of God. That he would also say, by the water 
and the blood. As a matter of fact, he would make sure to put emphasis on this, where he would say, not by water only, not just at the times that he, were, he was doing these great miracles, not just at the time of entering in to the ministry, not just whenever the dove was ascending, or the Holy Spirit was ascending upon him like a dove, not just whenever audibly before a great multitude that God declared, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Not just then, but the blood also. The death of Christ proves from God to mankind that that one being crucified was the Son of God. And turn with him to the book of Matthew chapter 27. Very, very famous statement. Uh, very accurate statement in Matthew 27. And, and we'll take some time uh, we'll read this one verse and then take a little time to build up to it that we might understand where the statement comes from. Matthew chapter 27, verse 54. Matthew 27, verse 54. This would be uh, as Christ would die. And some things happened. And we'll, we'll read through those things in a moment. So say, now when the centurion and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that were done. Again, we'll talk about those things. They feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. That their statements came not by the declaration of somebody's words, it was not by John who said, hey, I'm more witness, that's the Son of God. Not John the Baptist or John the disciple or any of the disciples. But rather some events unfolded outside of the control of any human. And as these events unfolded, that the centurions, and not just the centurions, but those that were, that were watching as well, that they would all, unanim all unanimously decide, truly, this was the Son of God. That... That, that, uh, that sign that they have nailed above his head, Jesus, the, the king of the Jews, that's true. That it may have been a, a mocking gesture that they had once decided. That, uh, that, that all of that mocking that it took place, that crown of thorns that was placed on his head, and the reed that was placed in his hand, and the robe, that, all of the mocking, all of those, 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 what they thought were empty words that they were using to try to degrade this Jesus of Nazareth, it turns out all of those words were actually accurate. And they all accurately described this one who we have just killed. Because of that, they feared greatly. What, what, there is good reason that they came to that conclusion. It was not just superstition. That it will back up and we'll take, we'll read of these things that unfolded. That we see the, that this witness, we see God witnessing to mankind that Jesus is the Son of God, beginning at, through the darkness that overcame the earth. We'll read up in verse 45. That it would say that now from the sixth hour, there was a darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which I'm certain I pronounced correctly. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That here at, at, at this event, that this, this very supernaturally, there is a, from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, a darkness over all the land. This is not just a, a normal eclipse. Uh, that a normal eclipse is a total darkness for three hours, and you've ever had the opportunity. I've never had the opportunity to sit through the entirety of a, of a full eclipse. I've sat through the entirety of, of a, of a, of a uh, very close to a full eclipse. Uh, but that, that it's not just darkness for three hours, that it gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer, and it's dark for a little while, and it gets lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter. And it may take hours to do it, but it's not what this describes. This describes darkness. It describes, it's, it's as though that in the very middle of the day, that all of a sudden it wasn't the middle of the day anymore, that it was in the middle of the night, and that this was done for a purpose, and that purpose was revealed in, chapter, in, in verse 46. That this darkness over the land was, was showing God the Father forsaking the Son as he had to. 
that this Jesus had in order to be the propitiation of our sins, in order to pay that debt, in order to purchase our redemption, that he would have to bear the weight and the punishment and the wrath of God on his own. And the part of the wrath of God is the forsaking of God, a, 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 a separating from God, and that Christ would have to be separated from the Father, that he would truly have to have that wrath poured out in order to be our redemption. And that took place. And not only did it take place inwardly, not only did it take place spiritually, but there was a physical sign for all the people of the land to behold of God the Father forsaking the Son. That, that, that we, we see it as we go on, verse 51. Uh, and in verse 51, it would say, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. That this would be right after that, that, he would, uh, cry, that he would give up the ghost in verse 50. That he would die on the cross, proclaiming it is finished, and he would yield up the ghost. At that moment, that within the temple, that, that veil that was to keep them protected, that veil that, that had separated them from the holy place, that it tore, and it didn't tear in a way that they could have tore it. That that the, the priests that, that they would have no real ability to go up and tear it from top to bottom. Uh, that, that it would not tear top to bottom normally, but that that is how it tore. That it would God Himself would physically tear that veil, and he did so for great purpose. We'll turn and read of that purpose in Hebrews chapter 10. Keep your spot here because we're coming back. Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 19, it says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he had consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And here in the book of Hebrews, it makes mention of drawing of, of boldly entering into the holiest but that it would only be possible it would only be made possible by the blood of jesus by the blood of that lamb who has purified us and washed us and paid our price that he would say that we could come by a new and living way that has been consecrated for us it says to for us to come through the veil and that's a very interesting way of putting it because it was that veil that prevented us from coming. That was the purpose of the veil, as you very well know, and I know that I made mention of these exact scriptures, and then that we, we, we've looked to this, but, but as that holiest would be set up, that, uh, that Nadab and, and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, that they learned a very, a very hard lesson, um, which they had their very own lives taken from them for offering up strange fire to the Lord, that this place, the holiest, that that place that was reserved uh, to meet in the presence of God, that it was a very serious place. It was a place that mankind had no right to come before. And that all of these things had to be done to allow them to enter in once a year. And that at the sacrifice of Christ, at the crucifying of him, at him being offered up for our sins, that there is now in a way that we can come boldly by Christ and by what he has done. Because he has taken that veil, so to speak, and placed it on himself, being crucified with it. It says that, that we can come through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. That he has made entrance into the holiest, into the presence of God, possible through his work here on the cross. And that there was a way in which God testified that we could believe in that. That, that this, again, this being a thing, not, not something that man did, not even something that they do understand that those Jews there in the temple witnessing such a thing as that, that they would not want the veil torn. They would not want to make up a story that the work of Christ is what tore the veil. But it just so happened that at the moment that Christ was crucified, that that veil tore from top to bottom. Whether anybody around wanted to see it or not, 
whether they wanted to admit to it or not, that it was God the Father himself declaring to mankind, that is my son, and the work that he has done is the only work that is going to allow you to enter to my presence and to come before me. And that's what we read in the book of Hebrews, and that is what the, the witness that we see at the crucifixion of Christ. Very clear communication from God. That we would also see as we continue to read in verse 51 back in Matthew 27, the, the rest of that verse, uh, that it would say, And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And what happens next is very strange. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. And so now understand as we finally get to verse 54 of this centur these centurions and those that watched with them that this is what they have seen. Three hours of darkness, a declaration from this man on the cross that God has forsaken him. And they kind of see that actually unfold. That this veil is torn, that there's an earthquake and a rock's rent, and all of a sudden a bunch of people who profess to believe that that man was actually God and who had died, now they're all alive again. And they all enter into Jerusalem. And they go and appear before their loved ones. It doesn't say one or two, it says many. An unmistakable amount. That all of these things take place. And obviously, I mean, my goodness, at, at the amount of witnesses that could declare, uh, they themselves being a witness, they were literally dead and they were no longer dead at that point. Uh, and an undeniable communication to mankind that this is different. This is no normal crucifixion. This is no normal person. But that truly, this is the Son of God. And as you get to the end of all of that, that was what they had said in verse 54. Uh, that they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. It is by the water and by the blood that we see that not just these men, but God himself has testified of the deity of Christ. That being said, we'll probably put off the spirit for another night. <laughs> See that we are just don't we either have to rush through it or be here for a lot longer. So I'll save y'all uh, some time, and we'll just say that uh, this will be the conclusion of the message, and we'll pick back up in verse six next week. We will. Wow.